Good morning, everyone, and thank you for being here this morning. It's um, unfortunate to say the way things go around this place is always conflicting hearings, so we'll have members coming in and going out and, uh, and very few on time, but we thought it would be wise to get started this morning if we could. This is not a formal subcommittee hearing, which means that we uh, can dispense with some of the formalities. I suggest what we'll do is we'll begin with brief opening statements. Um, I would like to ask Ranking Member Shays to go first because he has to go down someplace else as he discussed in the ante room and then back, and this will accommodate that uh, better. After that, uh, if there are other members who come and wish to make a statement, they may. Then we'll uh, proceed with opening statements uh, from the members of the panel, and then we'll have some time for questioning back and forth on that. And I hope and expect a frank and robust discussion this morning and appreciate your willingness to participate. understand that you had a great conference this week uh, with a lot of participation, and maybe we can replicate at least a small portion of that here today. Um, Mr. Chase? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for letting me um, go first here, and I'm going to be eager to come back real quick. So, Mr. Chairman, thank you for holding this briefing and for drawing attention to a matter which directly affects our national security and the security of our allies uh, around the world. For 50 years, the United States faced off against the nuclear-armed Soviet Union in the Cold War. No sooner did that conflict give way than terrorist groups and rogue nations redoubled their efforts and ambitions to obtain nuclear arms. The depth of our enemy's hatred for our great nation, her people, her freedoms, and her allies is limitless, and the violence to which we could fall victim is unimaginable. The reality we as Americans must understand is there is no greater national security challenge than ins ensuring our adversaries do not obtain nuclear weapons. If our adversaries came to possess such weapons, our national security challenges would be untenable. And if an enemy actually used a nuclear device, the physical and psychological damage to the United States and the world would be unmeasurable. Considering the depth of this threat, it is essential the United States work cooperatively with our international partners to ensure that a rigid, glo rigid global arrangement is in place to regulate and, where necessary, prevent the transfer of atomic material. The United States has taken an important leadership role in nonproliferation, but as our witnesses will discuss, weaknesses and challenges exist nonetheless. Mr. Chairman, today's briefing offers an outstanding opportunity to learn more about current international nonproliferation efforts and to hear competing proposals about how these efforts might be strengthened. We have assembled before us a panel of esteemed uh, experts, witnesses. I look forward to hearing from them as soon as I return. Mr. Chairman, I thank you again for organizing this briefing and to our witnesses for being here. Thank you, Mr. Chase. Thank you very much. You know, this briefing today is, uh, I think, an excellent opportunity to uh, have the members of Congress and, and the subcommittee uh, familiarize themselves with this issue probably more than they have been and, and hopefully all that they have to be. Uh, this will build a record, uh, you know, no matter what membership we have here on the panel, build a record for us to review along with your remarks that have already been placed on the record. We rarely get a chance to hear from international government officials uh, without leaving the country, so it's particularly nice for you to come. George and I have had the experience of being at some panels, uh, and I think it has great value. Uh, if we're going to shape and draft a bunch of uh, various treaties, whether they're bilateral or multilateral, uh, norms of behavior that encompass our combined international nonproliferation efforts, then we had better hear from the whole range of opinions and perspectives on this. I'm delighted that you're uh, going to share your experiences and expertise with us here. I think your voices are critical. Uh, there are so many unknowns that are facing us in this particular century, and I think two things are probably very, very true. The nonproliferation challenges during this century are only going to be larger and more complicated than those of the last century. Uh, as uh, Henry was just sharing with us earlier, uh, by showing us the, uh, the way that we go from uh, current proliferation that seems manageable to uh, a picture that's somewhat disturbing on that, and perhaps we can get you to expand on that uh, when it's time for your testimony and then some questioning. Uh, but these challenges are not going to be overcome uh, unless all of us work aggressively and cohesively together. Uh, in this century, we're no longer simply talking about disarmament of two huge nuclear arsenals of the United States and the uh, Soviet Union, but we face potential regional disputes among nuclear powers. We face more countries seeking to acquire nuclear weapons. We face the fracturing of consensus among nuclear states against the transfer of nuclear weapons technologies to other states. Uh, and we live in a world where nuclear terrorism, whether it's state-sponsored or sponsored by a radical group, potentially threaten all peaceful nations. And that's why expanding and strengthening the existing nonproliferation regime seems imperative to not only this country uh, in its national security, but to that of the entire world. I firmly believe that the United States has to be a constructive partner in strengthening nonproliferation regimes. 
We have to encourage multilateral cooperation and actively and fully participate in nonproliferation efforts. The strength of global nuclear security is directly proportional to how much effort and resources we and other countries invest in it. Unfortunately, it seems that in many ways we're currently heading in the exact opposite direction. While rogue regimes and terrorist groups work fervently to acquire nuclear weapons and technology, the current nuclear weapon states, including the United States, seem hesitant to step up to the plate and fulfill our responsibilities to strengthen the regime. At a recent subcommittee hearing that was held here on the potential weaponization of space, it was plainly evident that the State Department witnesses indicate that this administration has almost an allergic reaction to the mere mention of new and expanded treaties. And actions are even more important than words. Too often recently, the United States actions have not sent helpful or constructive messages to our international partners in the world com community. For example, what is the rest of the world supposed to make of this administration's request for building the so-called reliable replacement warhead and for Complex 2030, which would build up the United States nuclear arsenal instead of disarming it? A few years ago, Senator Luger, and I direct some of the witnesses' uh, attention over there. I think you've probably seen this chart before. Senator Luger surveyed nearly 100 top experts and asked them, have international nonproliferation efforts improved, stayed the same, or regressed during the last year? 44 percent entered uh, answered that things had regressed, 32 percent said that efforts had improved, and 21 percent responded that efforts were about the same. The Nuclear Threat Initiative, spearheaded by former Senator Sam Nunn, concluded that 2006 marked, and I quote, one of the worst years in the history of nonproliferation disarmament and arms control. Just this month, the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace released its 2007 report card for nonproliferation efforts. The world overall got a D plus. The Carnegie Endowment specifically noted, the United States has strongly affected the outcomes on which these grades are based because it is the most powerful actor in the international system and the historic leader in the nonproliferation regime. The report goes on to also stress that there's plenty of blame to go around. And I quote, responsibility for the rather dismal performance reported here is widely shared. The main author of this report is with us today to more fully explain what they found and why, and a few points are worth emphasizing. Carnegie gave a D to the international efforts to make nonproliferation irreversible, and an F, a failing grade, on efforts to devalue the political and military currency of nuclear weapons. These grades are alarming and indicative of both the lack of political will by nuclear states as well as the gaps in the current nonproliferation regime. In its conclusion, the report shares this dire warning, and again I quote, the world needs better than near failing performance if, to be, if it is to be spared a nuclear disaster. As an oversight and investigatory subcommittee of the United States Congress, we must ensure that nonproliferation efforts get the attention and support they critically need and deserve. By early 2009, as the Carnegie Report notes, at least four of the five veto members of the United Nations Security Council will have new leaders. Other current nuclear powers, such as Pakistan, are also facing major elections over the next several months. This emergence of new leadership in key countries will hopefully yield new possibilities for progress, but only if the emerging world leaders have the foresight and courage to seize those opportunities. I want to thank you all for uh, listening for this opening statement. I'm going to ask that our uh, witnesses begin their testimony here today, but I'd like to just make a couple of uh, comments for the record about our distinguished panel uh, and welcome Mr. Welsh from Vermont, who's uh, joined us here this morning also. Uh, the Honorable Martin Brenz, Brenz is Director of the Nuclear Nonproliferation Division in the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Alexei Abatov is a former member of the Russian State Duma and currently a scholar in residence at the Carnegie Moscow Center. Peter Goldschmidt is the former IAEA Deputy Director General and Head of the Department of Safeguards, former Director General of a company responsible for fuel supply and spent fuel management of seven Belgian nuclear plants, and currently a visiting scholar at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Henry Sokolowski is the Executive Director of the Nonproliferation Policy Education Center, and George Perkovich is the Vice President for Studies, Global Security and Economic Development at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. I want to thank every one of you for being here this morning and for your ideas on strengthening the nonproliferation regime. All of your statements have been put on the record completely and in their, in their entirety. Uh, so if you care to summarize your remarks, uh, that would be appreciated by us. Then we'll be able to have some questions back and forth. First, Mr. Welsh, do you have, care to make any opening statement? No, I just thank you for coming in this morning. I look forward to your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Brenz, uh, perhaps you'd care to start. German TNA? 
ranking member Shays, um, members of the subcommittee, thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak before you this morning. It's really a great honor for me to be here today. Uh, the issue we are going to talk about uh, is one of the most important for our future, WMD proliferation. Like terrorism, it is an area on which uh, multilateralism and international cooperation have to be effective if we, want, uh, if we don't want to face the potential consequences of a proliferated world. I will just start by uh, giving a brief assessment of the state of the non-proliferation regime. There are two ways to see it. One, I would say, is the glass half empty. Uh, the, North, the North Korean and the Iranian challenges are, uh, represent the sign that the non-proliferation regime is eroding uh, and more states are going to acquire nuclear weapons. The glass half full is a bit different. It's the idea that so far the darkest predictions have proven wrong and uh, they are, um, the, the NPT has more, uh, uh, is nearly universal and we have two hard cases left. North Korea and Iran. Uh, I would say that today the non-proliferation regime is facing five uh, main challenges. The first one is the challenge from North Korea and Iran. The second one is its own weaknesses. For example, the fact that there are no norms governing missiles or, or no inspection mechanism in the missile and biological areas. The spread of science and technology uh, in a globalized economy represents a further challenge. There are also some legitimacy concerns arising from perception of discriminations and also uh, a lack of effectiveness against new proliferation strategies such as the use of networks, for example the AQK network. So what can we do to respond to these challenges and prevent the proliferated world that Henry Sokolsky presented? Uh, first we have to deal with the Iranian and the North Korean challenge. This is the most urgent priority. North Korea we have to make sure that the, the current process is going to lead to the eventual, complete, irreversible uh, and verifiable disarmament of North Korea nuclear weapon program. In the case of Iran, two, three UNSC resolutions have been adopted and we, make, we want to make sure uh, that Iran is going to comply with these resolutions and return to suspension. So uh, wha what we are facing now is the prospect of a new UNSC resolution in the upcoming weeks, which is going to take more measures uh, but we'll, we can also improve uh, the non-proliferation regime. First, by improving existing instruments. And for example, France has tabled a proposal to make withdrawal from the nuclear non-proliferation treaty more difficult. We can also strengthen verification mechanism. We must also adopt new norms. And one that France and the US are very keen on uh, uh, adopting in, in Geneva is a fissile material cutoff. We think it will be very important to have this uh, new norm uh, adopted. We must also make sure that the development of nuclear energy in the world is not going to lead to more proliferation. And to do this, we must restrict access to the most sensitive fuel cycle technology, enrichment and reprocessing. I think the way to do this is not to forbid access to these technologies, but maybe to set up criteria, clear criteria for uh, exporting those technologies. And the other thing we must do, and France and the US and a number of other countries have tabled a proposal on this, is to uh, provide credible guarantees of nuclear fuel supply. We must also improve operational cooperation on a daily basis against proliferation by thwarting procurement attempts, intercepting WND related shipments, for example, in the framework of PSI, disrupting the financing of WND activities. But what will be most needed will be, on the part of all nations, a collective will to address the non-proliferation challenge. And we have to find a way back to collective security. And to do this, we must use all the, sorry, all the possibilities offered to us by the UN Charter and the UN Security Council to ensure compliance with the non-proliferation regime. It's very important to show that proliferation is not a problem only for the West, but for the world as a whole. Uh, I will just conclude by highlighting the fact that France, as a P5 member, of course, is uh, fully committed to this international effort to prevent and counter proliferation, and the EU as well. After all, it is three European countries, France, Germany, and the UK, which took the lead in July 2003 to uh, try to find a solution to the, the Iranian nuclear challenge. And we were very glad in June 2006 to see the US, Russia, and China uh, joining this effort. 
so I, I will stop there. I would just say that uh, this is an issue on which France and the US have cooperated extremely well in the past uh, few years. And this we, that's what we intend to pursue and further depend in, in the near future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brenz. And Dr. Abitar. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the subcommittee. It's gr great pleasure and honor for me to be here, especially because formerly I was your colleague for 10 years in Washington State Duma. I was deputy chair of the Defense Committee. Uh, and now I'm working as scholar in residence in uh, Moscow Carnegie Center. So there's life after the legislature. <laughs> Much better. Um, <coughs> for the United States, beside Iraq, Iran is the major uh, foreign security problem. Uh, for Russia, Iran is a problem. Russia is concerned about Iranian nuclear program and the Iranian non-compliance with IAEA and non-compliance with the Security Council resolution. But this, this is not the main problem for Russia. Other security problems for Russia are more important. Among them, the prospects of NATO expansion to Ukraine and Georgia, the prospects of um, uh, construction of uh, American ballistic missile defense in Poland and Czechia are higher priority for Russian security. That is not because Russia is wrong and America is right. It's because Russia has a different position and different history. Um, relations uh, with Iran for Russia are no less important now than for the United States were relations with Iran under Shah. And so, if Russia is to cooperate with the United States, which is actually doing, it wants its own security uh, concerns to be taken into account. Uh, recently, Foreign Minister of Russia, Lavrov, uh, made a presentation at Moscow Carnegie Center, and he said that the new mood of uh, reviving containment of Russia in the West will not be compatible with Russian cooperation with the West on the issues of security, which West considers to be of greatest importance. Um, for Russia, as I said, other security issues are very important. In particular, let me say a few words about ballistic missile defense. In the United States, uh, there is general opinion that it cannot be a threat to Russia. Uh, because uh, very few interceptors and the technical char characteristics cannot undercut Russian deterrence. In Russia, it is viewed differently. Russia remembers experience with NATO expansion. When it started with three countries, and we were told that that would be, the, uh, that would be it, then another seven countries joined. Now the prospects of Ukraine, uh, Georgia, and some suggest that Azerbaijan and Kazakhstan and others, which will directly border with Russia. So the same view is held with respect to ballistic missile defense. It's, it may start with a few interceptors and one radar, but who will give a guarantee that it will not expand and eventually undercut Russian strategic deterrence? That is why such a uh, sharp reaction in Moscow. Uh, th the majority of Russian strategic community in government and out of government uh, did not want to have any further dialogue with the United States. The pressure on President Putin to start implementing countermeasures against potential American ballistic missile defense was very strong. In particular, testing new missiles, withdrawing from uh, the treaty on intermediate and, ra and uh, short-range ballistic missiles, and developing medium-range missiles which can target directly American BMD deployment. That was the prevailing mood of the Russian political elite and strategic community. The minority, like myself, were trying to persuade the authorities that we need not to be only, ne only negative reacting to American initiatives, that we have to be positive as well. And that is why I'm very happy that President Putin recently proposed joint ballistic missile defense in Diva, starting with a uh, Russian uh, raider in Azerbaijan, which may already now cover what happened in Iran. I very much hope that the United States takes this initiative very seriously. 
because implications are really very bad. The implications are that Russia would recognize that the threat is coming from the south. Another implication, Russia recognizes that joint ballistic missile defense is in uh, with the United States is in Russian interest. Joint ballistic missile defense means basically an alliance. That means doing away with mutual nuclear deterrent. You cannot have common defense and, and have mutual nuclear deterrent. All those implications are so important that I very much hope that the United States takes this seriously and capitalizes on this initiative of President Putin. And the final observation, uh, we should not send Iran wrong signals. We have sent already a great salvo of wrong signal signals to Iran with what we have done with North Korea, permitting it to withdraw from the treaty, test to test the nuclear weapon, and then starting negotiating with it, trying to persuade it and to buy it with various concessions. Iran is watching that very carefully. So another wrong signal would be a hasty uh, 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 hasty construction of ballistic missile defense in Europe because that would give Iran a signal that it can get away safely with developing long-range ballistic missiles and nuclear weapons. Otherwise, ballistic missile defense is not needed. So we should not hurry with that and instead work jointly on ballistic missile defense and make sure that Iran does not move the way North Korea has done. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, Dr. Goldschmidt. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, in my very short presentation, I will limit myself to what I consider to be three priorities for strengthening the non-proliferation regime, and that is ratifying the CCDT, addressing cases of non-compliance, and dissuading states to withdraw from the NPT. Uh, as you know, to date, 138 states have ratified the CCDT. For this most important treaty to come into force, it still needs to be ratified by 10 more states, including the United States. This should be a priority in the field of nuclear non-proliferation. The very first concrete step should be for the US and China to ratify the CTDT, as has been done by the other nuclear weapon states, France, Russia, and the UK. Ratifying the CTBT is the very first of the 13 steps agreed by consensus during the 2000 NPT review conference, and it is the most convincing indicator of nuclear weapon states' willingness to comply with their NPT disarmament undertakings. Until more convincing progress is made in this area of irreversible nuclear disarmament, many nuclear, non-nuclear weapon states, sorry, will no doubt continue to oppose highly desirable tightening measures for the nuclear, the non-proliferation regime. Once the CTBT has been ratified by the US, by all nuclear weapon states, the chances that India would agree to follow the, their example would be much higher, provided, of course, that Pakistan does so too. For the reason highlighted in my written testimony, um, if the US-India deal goes through as it is today, it will make it politically impossible to strengthen the non-proliferation regime and any hope to create a WMD free zone in the Middle East will become even more unlikely. A first important milestone on the long road to establish such a WMD free zone in the Middle East would be for all states in the region that have not yet done so to sign and ratify the CTBT, in particular Israel, Iran, and Egypt. Another important case relates to North Korea. The ratification of the CTBT by North Korea would be a logical and important step and should therefore be mentioned explicitly in future discussions. Here again, the ratification of the CTBT by the US and China would make progress in this direction much more likely. And turning now to non-compliance, experience with both North Korea and Iran has shown that in order to conclude in a timely manner that there are no undeclared nuclear material activities in a state as a whole after, after the state has been found by the IA to be deliberately in non-compliance with its safeguards and protectings, the agency needs verification rights extending beyond those of comprehensive safeguards agreement and additional protocol. The most effective, unbiased, and feasible way to establish a legal basis for the necessary verification measures in circumstances of non-compliance 
are for the UN Security Council to adopt a generic and legally binding resolution stating that if a state is reported by the IA to be in non-compliance, the following three actions would result. First, the non-compliant state would have to suspend all sensitive nuclear fuel cycle activities for a specified period of time. Second, if requested by the, I the IAEA, the Security Council would automatically adopt a specific resolution making it mandatory for the non-compliant state to provide the agency with the necessary additional verification authority. And finally, no nuclear material would henceforth be delivered to that state without the guarantee that all nuclear material, equipment and facilities declared to the IE would remain under agency safeguards even if that state's withdrawal from the NPT. And this brings me to the last point, which is withdrawal from the NPT. A particularly threatening case for international peace and security is the withdrawal of a non-nuclear weapon state from the NPT after, after having been found by the IA in breach of its obligation to comply with its safeguards agreement. In such a case, it is of paramount importance for the Security Council to convene immediately in order to consider what appropriate measures should be taken and not as has been the case with North Korea three years after its withdrawal when it tested a nuclear device. We must by all means avoid a repetition of this unfortunate chain of events. Therefore, the UN Security Council should adopt another generic and legally binding resolution stating that, first, if a state withdraws from the NPT after being found by the IA to be non-compliance, then such withdrawal constitutes a threat to international peace and security as defined under Article 39 of the UN Charter. And therefore, the UN Security Council would have to meet immediately. This generic resolution should also provide that under these circumstances, all material and equipment made available to such a state under comprehensive safeguards agreement would have to be forthwith removed from that state under agency supervision. And finally, I would suggest that the resolution should request that all military cooperation with the withdrawing state be automatically suspended. The three proposals made here are addressing real practical issues and are based on lessons learned from past experience. They are fully in line with the letters and spirit of the NPT and should be in the interest of all states that have no intention of developing nuclear weapons. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mr. Sikalski. First, I want to thank you for permitting me to testify today. Um, I had the privilege of testifying, I believe, on some of the preliminary findings of my center September 26th before this committee. Um, today, I will give you the final recommendations that we made. Uh, I also testified May 10th uh, before the House Committee on Foreign Relations. How did I do? They, they keep changing the name. Yes. Um, on a very general approach to nonproliferation. Uh, we, we, we tend to talk, uh, when we talk about nonproliferation in terms of international institutions and start trying to figure out what these institutions should agree to, which immediately gets us into, well, how can we get agreement with other countries to get these institutions to vote correctly? I'm not against that. Um, but I, I think we need to fortify those efforts with what I would call uh, the invisible hand of God. Uh, Adam Smith talked about this. He, Adam Smith or God, take your pick, has been trying to help us on nonproliferation for a long, long time. It turns out the most dangerous nuclear activities in the most dangerous places are the most uneconomical. We have been fighting this point every inch of the way. How do we do it? We appropriate subsidies. We authorize special uh, treatments and mandates, and not just us, but everyone else. The general idea would be to at least know how much we do that. And by the way, in all fairness, we don't just do it with nuclear power, although it's <laughs> gotten more than its fair share. 
I think we, we're going to have to identify what that subsidy is, and we're going to have to include that in any cost comparison with other choices, and we're going to have to encourage countries and ourselves to resist ladling on more. Uh, I would like to ask permission to have a paper on this general argument placed into the record that was produced for the 20th Century Fund. Without objection. I should say the Century Fund, because the 20th Century has passed. They changed their name. Um, beyond that, I'd like to talk specifically on what we can do to strengthen international nonproliferation efforts to block diversions of civilian nuclear materials to make bombs. It's a very narrow set of concerns, but pretty much on point. Uh, we certainly have a handful keeping North Korea and Iran from using their programs to make bombs. There's the problem of India, uh, which Congress will have to soon grapple with again in judging whether or not the safeguards that are now being proposed for that country can really effectively prevent U.S. and foreign nuclear cooperation from helping New Delhi's weapons program. I would submit that it's very unlikely that they will. And I guess the whole world's going to be watching this body and what it does and how tough it is about whether the criteria are met. You should at least <coughs> make sure that the Hyde Act really is followed. I mean, we went to so much effort to pass that one. Uh, in addition to the 31 states that currently operate large reactors, no fewer than 14 in the last 18 months have announced intention to acquire large reactors themselves by 2020. Many of these states are in the Middle East. Uh, a lot of them won't really achieve their stated goal, but with the help from the United States, China, and Russia, some will. And that is going to be very, very nettlesome. We're going to have countries like Egypt, Turkey, and probably Saudi Arabia with large reactors, which roughly is the long pole in the tent to make a bomb. It's not that hard once you have a reactor really to go to the last couple of steps to make a bomb. And the, the ability of the IEA to prevent this, I think, is highly overrated. In any case, uh, since the fall of 2005, my center has consulted with officials from the IEA, the UK, the US, Germany, and France, as well as outside experts, commissioned a series of studies. And we came to seven conclusions, which I'd just like to read, and then end with three general observations. One of the conclusions uh, that we reached was that you really need to resist calls to read the NPT as recognizing a per se right to any and all nuclear technology, no matter how difficult it is to safeguard against being diverted or how uneconomic it is. Second, and this is a pretty important one, it's critical that we begin to distinguish between what can actually be effectively safeguarded to prevent diversions to make bombs, and what at best can only be monitored to perhaps detect diversions after they occur. We describe everything the agency does as if there was no distinction. Sadly, this is not the case. And we need to get our own government to make the distinction and encourage other governments and eventually the IEA to make the distinction. We need to reestablish material accountancy as the IA's top safeguards mission by pacing the size and growth of the agency's safeguards budget against the size and growth of the number of significant quantities, that's bombs worth, of special nuclear material and bulk handling facilities, that's bomb making, I should say fuel making, Freudian slip, nuclear fuel making facilities that the agency must account for and inspect. By the way, at the end of the testimony, there's another chart which is pretty, I mean, I, it's a little... It's more boring than that. Well, it's more boring, but it doesn't look good. Uh, the budget's about doubled. The amount of bombs worth have gone up sixfold, and we're talking 10 to 20 bombs worth. You cannot keep doing that and stay on top. It, that's a recipe for real mischief. Uh, for greater attention on useful safeguards activities that are necessary but have yet to be developed, it needs to be paid. We need to pay greater attention to them. There are a number of things the IA actually does pretty well and could do very well if it was properly funded. I list them. I'm sure there are a few others, but we need to get on with getting them the money, which leads to the next recommendation. The current UN formula, which is based on GMP, 
uh, GDP for raising IEA funding needs to be complemented with a user fee based on how many kilowatt hours the country produces. Uh, I won't get into that, but that's way overdue. And there's some very simple things Congress can do to, to set an example that will make everyone sort of follow in suit. It, it's not that hard to do. Uh, we, of course, need to follow Pierre Goldschmidt's advice and that of the French government about establishing default actions against various levels of IEA safeguards agreement noncompliance. Uh, and finally, we need to plan on meeting future safeguards requirements on the assumption that the most popular innovations, which you have many hearings on up here, on integrated safeguards, that's the additional protocol, proliferation resistant fuel cycles, that's GNETs, uh, international fuel assurances and, ban and banks, that none of this stuff is really going to work. I think you have to assume that it probably won't. And it might even make matters worse under a number of circumstances. We are assuming that these are the fixes. I, my guess is that's not the case. Uh, in conclusion, let me just say that uh, I think unless we do this, things are going to get very, very grim a lot faster uh, than we would like. And that I think Congress and the White House can advance what's needed, actually, and dramatically enhance the IA safeguards effort well before there's complete international consensus. Generally, what happens on the Hill is the argument is, well, we've got to wait till someone else does something. I don't think you do. Uh, in fact, the study that I submitted today identifies at least 10 specific measures that Congress and the executive could take unilaterally or with like-minded states. Some of these measures, promoting non-nuclear, non-petroleum alternative sources, which means essentially following a law that was passed 30 years ago. It's never been complied with. There's a whole lot of steps. It's called Title IV, Title V of the Nuclear Nonproliferation Act. It is a remarkably uh, well-written uh, set of re reporting requirements and uh, program uh, authorization uh, urgings that have been totally ignored by Democrats and Republicans. So I want you to look at that. There are a number of other suggestions, but I think I've extended well beyond my allotted time, so I'll stop and hope that we'll have questions. I think we will. Thank you. I, I would guess that you're, you're running for that competition of the half glass empty that um, Mr. Brenz was talking about. <laughs> Mr. Perkovich. Thanks, Chairman Tierney and the subcommittee. I think it's, it's great that you uh, have invited international voices as, as we discussed. It's, it's quite befitting for the United States, given the reach of our power and our interest, to, to do this. And so that it's an exception is something, you know, we all ought to try to correct. What I thought I'd focus on this morning are some steps that I think uh, are particularly important for the U.S. Congress to consider, what Congress can do uh, in this area. <coughs> and I think the first point is, is a strategic one for, for the Congress to understand the, the basic strategic principle that the United States can't protect itself or its interests without a system of rules uh, to manage nuclear materials, uh, the production of fissile materials, exports, imports, and other facets of the overall nuclear enterprise. We have to have rules. We have to strengthen those rules. And there were a number of proposals uh, across the table here precisely to strengthen rules in ways that we all would agree, and, and I think probably you know, most experts in this field would agree are very important. Um, and, and so they need to be strengthened. But then obviously the enforcement of them needs to be strengthened which leads to a kind of a cor corollary of that strategic principle, which is that in order to get those rules and their enforcement, the U.S. as a major power, as the largest nuclear power, uh, must be prepared to engage in give and take and to also accept some constraints potentially on its power. Um, I'm not going to repeat a number of the suggestions my colleagues made, but, uh, but again, I think th there are a number of innovations here that are worth following. Um, I do want to talk about uh, uh, three things, though, in particular. One is, uh, it was mentioned about how important the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty is, ratifying that. That's a function of the Senate, uh, not of the House. But there is an issue where the House has voted um, to reduce the funding for the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty organization, um, which, if there ever is to be a treaty, uh, this organization uh, will, will monitor it and implement it. And, and I think it's somewhat of a mystery of how um, the, the funding got reduced, but uh, the U.S. 
share is supposed to be twenty four million and i think in the current budget uh, proposal or draft uh, it's been cut to ten million and so that's something uh, that that might be uh, looked into the another important step again was mentioned by two colleagues i just want to reaffirm it don't budge on the u s indian nuclear deal you all work very hard on the hyde act uh, it was passed last year it's law um, there will be an attempt, I believe, by the administration to either get you to reinterpret or look the other way or a wink uh, under pressure from India, uh, which wants to push. So if, if, if the Congress cares about nonproliferation, as we all say, just do something very simple, which is say uh, we voted, we passed the law, we're sticking uh, with it. I think that would be a very important signal. Let me turn to Iran. Um, we have a 28-year record uh, that I suggest shows that unilateral, often congressionally mandated sanctions don't work. Um, I, I'm not saying that sanctions don't work in general and shouldn't be pursued, but I think we have to be much more strategic about the use of sanctions. And in the case of Iran, the first thing to know is that UN Security Council sanctions actually get the attention of Iran. That's something they very much um, want to avoid because it suggests that it's the entire world that has, has, has deemed them to be out of bounds. Um, and you see this when the sanctions were finally adopted last year, the reaction in Iran was upsetting. Conversely, US congressionally mandated sanctions, unilateral sanctions, are almost music to the ears of the people who are the biggest problem in Iran because they know how to play that game. It's a game of denunciation and, 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 and bombast. And so it, it, we miss the leverage that you can get from UN sanctions by, by pursuing unilateral sanctions. In the case of Iran, it's particularly problematic because we have sanctions legislation drafts now and we have adopted sanctions in the past that are either co-sponsored by or voted by people who are on paper supporting the Mujahideen Calf, which the State Department says is a terrorist organization. Um, and so from an Iranian point of view and from many other people looking at it from the world, if you have a, a, a body imposing sanctions on Iran, some of whose sponsors are supporting what our own government says is a terrorist organization operating against Iran, the legitimacy and the political power of those sanctions is very problematic. And so you have to look at how this is perceived uh, elsewhere. Again, I don't mean to suggest that we should do nothing or that sanctions aren't useful, but it's a way to do it. Another example, we have UN resolutions 1540 and 1373. These are path-breaking resolutions. Uh, 1540 um, basically requires all countries to adopt and implement new laws to prevent the proliferation of WMD. Um, it upset a lot of countries in the world because it was the Security Council basically legislating uh, to the world. 1373 is on terrorism, that, that again, it's, a, it's, a, it's an obligation of all states to bar funding and other activities related to terrorism. Both of those resolutions can be cited as authorities for what we're trying to do with Iran. And yet, strangely enough, in the, in the uh, H.R. Uh, 1400 and the current drafts, those resolutions aren't mentioned at all. That authority is not invoked whatsoever in trying to then put forward new U.S. sanctions. And so you're not using the thing that has the most international respect and authority um, to try to accomplish our objectives, which seems to me uh, very counterproductive. Another example um, of what would be more effective and strategic is to look at, for example, how Russia has been dealing with the issue of providing fuel for the Bushir reactor. So we tend to write sanctions and go off and give speeches and everything else, which then Ayatollah Khomeini loves because he can give Friday prayers and say this is what the Americans are doing. Russians do something very different. They say, of course we're going to supply the fuel to Bushir. We're going to fulfill our contract. We won't break our contract. And they've said that, you know, periodically for the last four years. The fuel never shows up. The Iranians get the message and think it's pretty subtle. Um, the Russians keep saying, don't worry, it's going to come, it's going to come, there's a problem, there's a That is a much more effective way to deal with it um, than to do something and pass a law which angers a lot of your allies and other people and gives uh, the Iranians actually something uh, that they like. And so I think we ought to look to that subtlety. Another more subtle thing is in the draft of the sanctions that's being proposed, it says we should bar, the U.S. should now try to bar Iran's entry into the World Trade Organization, the WTO. 
Well, the people who are the problem in Iran, the Revolutionary Guards and others, don't want Iran to join the WTO. They make all their money on having a closed economy because they control the smuggling, the counterfeiting, and everything else. So the people who want to join the WTO are the people who don't like the Revolutionary Guards and the current regime and are the people we want to support, but now we're going to sanction the activity that they want and reward the people that we're trying to, uh, uh, to, to dissuade. There's another element in, in the bill, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to be critical, I'm just trying to say, okay, how can, how can we be uh, constructive? The draft legislation talks about and has language. It says these sanctions apply and it shall apply until Iran stops its nuclear weapons program. Well, there's a problem with that, which is that no one has established that Iran has a nuclear weapons program. Um, the U.S. government hasn't established that Iran has a nuclear weapons program. The IAEA hasn't established that Iran has a nuclear weapons program. The U.N. Security Council has not established that Iran has a nuclear weapon program, and the bill itself doesn't define how, how do we, how does Congress establish that Iran has a nuclear weapons program. And so one of the problems is if you go off then and try to go to others and, and get them to join us, they don't even know what the basis is for making, uh, what the predicate of the whole, of the whole uh, action is. If we could say, and if the U.S. government could say that we knew Iran had a nuclear weapons problem, that would be the smoking gun and we wouldn't be in all the negotiations and everything else uh, that we are in. Um, again, there are things that we can do and so I, I think the thing that's most alarming to Iranians and to uh, business actors in other countries, so extraterritorial effect if not by sanctions, is Governor Schwarzenegger and others talking about pulling pension fund investments out of companies that invest you know, voluntary, not legislatively mandated, moral suasion. Believe me, it's got a lot of companies in Europe and elsewhere paying attention because they don't want their stocks to die. And I've talked to executives and leaders in other countries and they say, well, wait a minute, if we're going to choose our stock price or building a cement factory in Iran, we're going to protect our stock price. This is but again, it's not congressionally mandated. You don't get into all of those legitimacy issues. It doesn't play into the hands uh, of the people we're trying to affect in Iran. It's quiet, it's subtle, and very powerful. And so I would urge our thinking more in those lines in terms of trying to uh, shape I Iranian behavior than to rely on kinds of instruments that we know haven't worked for 28 years. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gregorius. Thank you all. Uh, it was thought-provoking and, and uh, interesting, to say the least. You know, I, I, I make the last ob observation, uh, Mr. Gregorius, that when you talk about the voluntary stock uh, disinvestment aspect on that, if uh, some of these international trade agreements go through, that option won't be available. Uh, and that's something I think that we ought to be concerned about. If, uh, mm -hmm. if you read the language of all those multilateral and some sort of bilateral mm -hmm. agreements, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the corporations that get involved sort of try to put a provision in there that you can't mm -hmm. make those kind of decisions either as a state or an individual or uh, mm -hmm. district, and that would take one of our tools away. Mm -hmm. uh, with the indulgence of my colleagues, I'm going to start the questioning here, uh, and it's almost difficult to know where to start, but we had a little conversation in the back room before we came out uh, about the, uh, the fact of whether or not um, these agreements can continue to be verifiable and whether or not uh, they can be uh, enforced on that. And on the enforcement side of it, I think it came down to a discussion of uh, national will, whether or not the, co the countries involved have that will uh, and what is going to uh, give incentive to the countries to step forward and exercise that will. If uh, each of you or whoever would care to respond to that, I'd, I'd like to hear some comments on the record. Mr. Sikulski, I can see you inching forward. Oh boy, this is, this is deafening. If what you're talking about is the, I want to make sure I understand the question. Sure. Is it is it noncompliance with the IEA and, and safeguards agreements and the NPT that you're concerned about? No, I'm concerned about uh, countries generally, you know, wanting to enforce those provisions. Going to the UN, United Nation, Nations Security Council uh, sometimes remains inactive in the face of, of situations, and uh, I think it's clear in many instances that something is going on that ought to get UN uh, Security Council action but all these different uh, elements of you know, national interest involved in that, how yeah. do we get them moving in a direction to get things I done? I think that uh, it's unsatisfactory what we've done in these institutions. What's 
you know, the United States, for example, kind of pulled its punch on saying anything about the noncompliance report that was filed with the UN Security Council on North Korea and then said even less when, when North Korea withdrew. It wasn't until they tested a device. And then as soon as they tested a device, we scurried up and figured out how to, you know, keep the, the talks alive in such a way that, you know, a lot of Japanese people are very, very unhappy right now about what we're doing. It looks, I guess I side with Mr. Bolton on this. It's not a great look. I think even our Russian friend here is very concerned. Good. I think a lot of this problem about getting proper action in these institutions has to do with an unwillingness to act very clearly at home. There are things the U.S. Congress and the executive could have done and, uh, you know, with regard to uh, withdrawal uh, that it chose not to do. Uh, for example, uh, we did go after the illicit uh, banking uh, in North Korea. It really got their attention because the Communist Party in that country needs to be bribed to function. It needs hard currency. Very, very sensitive about this. We did not tie that to the withdrawal. We could have just rhetorically done so. So the point is, is that there are a number of things that each country can do to help support international action and consensus going into those bodies. We, we, we have not done that. Yes, doctor. I think your question is right to the point. And, um, the, the problem, as you know, is when you have a specific case, uh, then politics gets into the, the picture. And since you have five veto-wielding members of the Security Council, uh, there might be constraints and conflicting interests uh, that might not able countries who, in principle, would agree with some consequences to the to, uh, to, to failings and, and uh, non-compliance to really uh, support uh, resolutions in, in the UN Security Council. And this is why uh, my proposal is to try uh, to have generic resolutions which are not state specific. You see, it's establishing the, the rules, if you wish, uh, when there is not a specific case saying that if that happens, there will be automatic consequences, at least getting together when the state withdraw from the NPT, like it didn't happen with North Korea because China was not in favor of doing that for internal reasons. Now, of course, today the, the difficulty is that everyone will link and say, have in mind the North Korean and Iranian case in mind and say, okay, but nevertheless, I mean, uh, whenever there is an opportunity, I think that's a way to progress and not circumvent the veto right, but at least avoid the fact that the international community doesn't tackle the, the real issue. So I think this is the, what the solution. Is, what is the general consensus on the panel as to the likelihood of a, of a generic resolution like that actually passing if all the, the time was right and it was, wasn't going to be designed as it being focused at one country like North Korea or Iran? Is that something that the general consensus is it would pass? Well, yes, no? th there is, I think there is only few examples where 1540, I think, is, is a kind of generic resolution. On, on, so, uh, and and a lot of people seems to to be in favor of that, but no one is moving. So someone must take the initiative to to so push those ideas forward. I, I think it's more upbeat than that. Uh, first of all, things like this are slow moving, uh, but they are moving. Uh, I remember we had a conference with a with uh, several people from uh, different governments, including the French government, in two thousand and two. It ended up in their white paper. Now the EU is backing this general point. Even the United States finally came to its senses on this point and is backing it. Now, what if the US and the EU actually, in their own laws, actually spelled out what they would suspend in the way of transfers and controlled nuclear goods to a country that the IA Board of Governors was unable to find in compliance? What if they didn't wait on the UN and just said, this is what we're going to do, and this is lay that out? I would think that you would have more countries 
joining up that are on the Security Council. I don't think Russia or China want to be constantly on the outside of a general proposition, but I think Pierre is right. If it looks like you're ganging up on a specific country, they will not move with you. Yes, just a short comment uh, about the, the idea, and we just talked about. Uh, I think the NSG guidelines, you know, the nuclear surprise group guidelines, already have incorporated a provision of that kind. Uh, just uh, about the idea of a generic resolution, uh, I find it a good idea as such, and we have already adopted 1540, and another resolution of that kind would be very useful. The problem is that uh, to which extent the generic resolution is going to remain generic in the context of the Iranian nuclear crisis and the, the North Korean nuclear crisis. So some countries might object to this idea because they will find that this is a resolution on Iran or North Korea. So with the right timing, we should certainly do this, adopt a generic resolution. In the meantime, uh, what has happened in the past 12 months is very interesting. I mean, we have adopted in the UNSC five resolutions concerning WMP proliferation, two on North Korea and, and three on, uh, on Iran. And we are slowly building, you know, a, n a number of very useful principles and references uh, in dealing with those two countries that are going to be extremely useful for the future. So we, we must, uh, before we can, uh, we have the right uh, timing to have a generic resolution, we should build on that, on, on these five resolutions. I'm just going here. We're going to give plenty of time to everybody here, so it's fine. When uh, non-proliferation treaty entered into force in 1970, the primary goal was to get as many countries to become members of the treaty as possible. Now, all countries uh, which are out of the treaty are nuclear weapon states. India, Pakistan, Israel, and North Korea. All other countries are members of non-proliferation treaty, the five nuclear weapon states and other non-nuclear weapon states. That means that further proliferation among states will happen either through clandestine development of nuclear materials and nuclear weapons, diversion of peaceful nuclear programs into military ones, or through open withdrawal from the treaty and, uh, do and uh, becoming a nuclear weapon state, or a combination of both. That gives us a clue as to how to strengthen non-proliferation regime. Um, I repeat, that as far as states are concerned, I'm not talking about nuclear terrorism uh, now. It's a little bit different problem. We have to make sure that no clandestine uh, violation is possible. And that means expanding the authority of IAEA, providing it with additional resources, staff, personnel, giving it full support of the Security Council, and uh, making the countries adopt additional protocol of 1997, which virtually permits uh, inspection everywhere in, a, uh, in any site of non-nuclear we weapon state, maybe a site of inspection, provided that we know where to look. That is up to national intelligences to, 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 to provide to IAEA the clue where to go and to look. Now only 78 states are uh, states that ratified uh, this 1997 additional protocol, which adds a lot to safeguard capacity of IAEA, including Russia and the United States, which are still not members, just has, have not yet ratified. That needs to be done. And the uh, being um, uh, a state ha that has ratified additional protocol should be a sine qua non for any future deal on nuclear materials or technology with res uh, in peaceful cooperation in the world. Second point about withdrawal. That has to be given a narrow interpretation if you use some of the language that was uh, originated in American Congress. Article 10.1 provides for a certain procedure for withdrawal and brings into play the Security Council, which has to be involved in this. This was largely ignored, as my colleagues have pointed out. This has to be made very strict, very strong, and certainly uh, the uh, reservations ha have to be taken. You cannot withdraw to conceal your past violations. You cannot withdraw to use materials and technology acquired for peaceful purposes 
to use them in order to use them for military purposes. These are legal and logical interpretations of the provisions of the treaty which are to be adopted and supported by nuclear uh, weapon states of the Security Council. Okay. And uh, finally, in order to do that, we need cooperation of members of the uh, non-proliferation treaty. Uh, the, the most proper way to adopt such interpretation and resolutions is uh, review conferences. But review confer conferences have turned into a conferences of conflict between nuclear weapon states and non-nuclear weapon states. The primary uh, reason and uh, uh, accusation on the part of non-nuclear weapon states is that nuclear weapon states are not living up to their commitment under Article 6 of the Non-Proliferation Treaty going forward with, with, with nuclear disarmament. That is why I fully agree with my colleagues that CTBT is number one priority. Revival of intensive negotiations on fissile material shutoff is second priority. These two things may move forward the process of nuclear disarmament and make review commission, re review conferences, an instrument of fortifying the treaty rather than destroying it. Thank you. Um, Dr. Goldschmidt, you were? Thank you. Yeah, I, I fully agree with what was said, uh, but I want to make uh, one comment, uh, which is important. It's, uh, th there is a the general opinion that the additional protocol allows the IEA to go anywhere, anytime to verify and have unannounced inspections, uh, uh, which would be great, uh, which is what is in the IEA statute, in fact. Uh, however, it's not the case. The additional protocol has been drafted in a way that it, it um, there are a lot of limitations on how the agency can implement in practice this, uh, this uh, access, uh, additional access rights. And clearly, this is reflected in the case of Iran, where the Director General in his reports has many times stated that in the case of Iran, Iran should show, it's a nice way to put it, transparency that goes beyond the additional protocol. And this is why it is, but, and the, and the IA also issued uh, adopted resolution saying that Iran should go beyond uh, the additional protocol. But IEA resolutions do not give IEA inspectors any legal right to do anything more than what is, has been agreed between the state and the IEA under uh, the comprehensive safeguard and possibly additional protocol. And this is why only the UN Security Council under Chapter 7 can say that if a state has been in non-compliance, because you don't have to penalize all uh, states in compliance, but if you have been found in breach then automatically the IEA should have additional investigation authority that should be very well specified, uh, and that's legally binding. And I want to make that cl very clear. And the statute provides for uh, anywhere, anytime, but in practice it's not the case. Mr. Shimon, why don't we go to Peter, who's been here a bit longer, and I'll just kind of catch up and get thank you. Mr. Welch. I'd be interested in uh, your comments on the impact of uh, the proposal here in Congress uh, to proceed with a reliable replacement warhead program. Uh, and also there's been some reference to uh, uh, the, 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 the impact of the agreement with uh, India on civil nuclear cooperation. Uh, and so my question uh, for a brief response from each of the panelists is what's the impact of inaction that's within our control to take on the reliable replacement warhead program and on the uh, uh, s cooperation on civil nuclear with uh, India. Can I skip him? I'll, 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 I'll try first. The, um, on the reliable replacement warhead, I mean, I'm, I'm sure the labs will have all sorts of great rationales about why they need to do it, but I, and I think it's a, what we're talking about here of building the political will to enforce rules and take these steps that we all agree. It's a political process. I mean, you guys are congressmen, there are parliamentarians around the world, you know how politics works. And so if, if the most powerful country in the world who's been trying to lead the charge to enforce the non-proliferation rules says, oh, and by the way, we're gonna develop a new nuclear weapon, whatever the arcane 
you know, scientific reasons for that are the politics of it around the world are, you're going to do what and you want us to do what? And it just, it doesn't work. So I, I've been in 23 countries in the last two years talking about this. And it just comes up and, and you try to explain, well, it's not so bad and so on. People don't hear it. Just as a political reality, yeah. it just doesn't pass the common sense test. couple of comments. First, I think you, you've heard uh, uh, earlier comments that the India deal needs to at least be compliant with the law. There is a very good reason to believe that since the Indians are now saying, well, even though the Hyde Act says you shouldn't be giving us permission to reprocess American fuel unless it's part of a major nonproliferation research program, uh, you should, and, and we're going to ask you to do that. It's going to be very difficult to figure, if you say yes to that, how the U.S. government will be able to say with a straight face that it isn't assisting India in making fuel for a breeder reactor, which will be unsafeguarded, that will produce weapons. India is not uh, required to adhere to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, but we are. We signed it. And one of the things it says is you cannot help other countries make nuclear weapons that didn't have them as of January 1, 1967. That would be India. So the Hyde Act was very prescient about this problem. Whether or not Congress is going to roll over and play dead on this is an interesting question. People will be watching. Two other comments. With regard to the, the warhead, I have to say that if Congress can keep the budget much smaller, because I, I don't know that it needs as much money as they're asking for, really keep it so that it isn't tested, and the numbers result in a smaller stockpile, I really think it's a hard argument to say shouldn't be supported. I mean, I you know. I know everyone's nervous out there, but the fact of the matter is I don't think per se that program should be dismissed. If, on the other hand, it's overblown in budget, it's going to lead to nuclear testing, and it doesn't result in a major reduction in warhead, it's a pretty bad idea. So I think it's continued. Finally, I, I, I'm not so wild about the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, and I'm definitely bearish about the Fissile Material Co-op Treaty. Uh, the comprehensive test ban, I think we do need to put some kind of incentive in place so that Iran doesn't flare off a bomb. And, you know, eventually I suspect it may be that, you know, a comprehensive test ban is something we would need to support. But there are a lot of interim steps that can be taken to give Iran that incentive short of the treaty. And I'm not sure, frankly, we're ready for it. The world is proliferating. It's not like the numbers are going down of countries interested in getting bombs. They're going up. The Fissile Material Cutoff Treaty, I guess my problem with it is the problem that I don't think everyone uh, has confronted yet. The IEA safeguards only work on a couple of processes. It does not work for fuel making. We do have no way of knowing exactly whether a country has given up making fuel for bombs if it's making fuel for reactors. It is virtually indistinguishable. Mm. And uh, the idea that if we simply assert that we will go with their stated intent and that's good enough strikes me as undermining our own comprehension of the limits of what's safeguardable to begin with for the IEA. The administration has not emphasized this point. They should. And I think the proponents of Fissile Material Cutoff Treaty don't talk about it anywhere near enough. But that's the heart of the matter. One of the reasons why the IEA is weak with regard to highly enriched uranium, MOX, and separated plutonium, why the President of the United States, Mr. Albardi, uh, NTI, all are talking about how do we keep countries from making nuclear fuels, is the safeguards don't work for those activities, not well enough. If we're really lucky and we spend a lot of money, and, and I'm willing to see us spend a lot more, we could probably detect diversions after they occurred. That's not good enough. 
but the idea that we can detect them before they occur, no. Uh, thank you. I, I, I am uh, um, uh, encouraged by your, your, attempt, your uh, sense that Congress might actually follow the laws it passes. Uh, <laughs> it's it's, it's never a foregone conclusion, <laughs> however. <laughs> For this is the reason you have to have hearings on what you <laughs> pass. Thank you. Dr. Goldsmith, just uh, in addition to my question, you headed the organization that uh, Mr. Sokolsky uh, was referring to. Do, do you agree with his uh, observations? <coughs> well, I think what he's saying is that you c the IEA is not equipped to judge intention. Yeah. That's obvious. Yeah. Uh, the IEA has a very uh, well-defined and important essential mandate uh, but in it has nothing to do, for instance, with weaponization activities. It has nothing to do with missiles and things like that. So um, when you have indeed the same or similar uh, technology being used for peaceful users and possibly military users, and you cannot uh, have a look into whether there are uh, weaponization activities on the side, uh, it's very difficult to, to, to give an early warning whether these peaceful users are uh, intended for other users also or not. And um, that's, uh, and I don't think we will change that uh, in the future. But uh, the, 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 the IEA has done a major change over the last, say, 10 years, is that the, the IEA went away from the purely accounting part of this, of this mandate, which is to make sure that the all declared nuclear material I is not diverted uh, to a much more analytical uh, approach to safeguards, and, and that's very important, and the additional protocol is essential for, for that analysis to, to, to bear fruit, and this is why, uh, so this would give an early indication that there might be undeclared activities, even uh, when there is no nuclear material used in those activities. And Let me ask you one other thing uh, that goes to points that uh, Dr. Arbatov was making and see uh, your, your reaction to it. So I understood what Dr. Arbatov said is that uh, NATO expansion uh, and the, uh, uh, the, the missile shield proposals by the United States uh, both uh, make Russia uh, insecure and have an adverse impact on our capacity uh, to have an ally in nuclear non-proliferation. Uh, tell us your views on that and, and suggested that the U.S. embrace the Putin proposal about cooperation on any kind of anti-missile activity. What's your view on that and how would it fit into the overall effort to uh, improve rather than weaken uh, uh, nuclear pr proliferation efforts? Yeah. No, I, th I think it's, it's absolutely crucial to have Russia on board. I mean, th this is uh, Russia and, and, and China, and start with Russia, of course. We, we, we need, we need, the Russia has the same objective in, in, in non-proliferation as, as any other uh, Western state, for sure. Um, of course, there are, there are other interests and strategic interests and differences and, uh, that countries wants to bargain and say, uh, well, yeah. if you want us to help you on what you think is a priority, like uh, Mr. Abatov said, well, take into account our other concerns, and that's fair international right. interaction. So bottom line, though, bottom but, but line Russia would be is key. The bottom so line is that uh, we should pause on the uh, NATO expansion uh, effort, uh, and that's I the implication. It's, it's, it's expand or, yeah. or stay, stay stable. I, I don't know. This, this would be the question of negotiation, and I'm not an okay. expert in that, uh, but I'm what right. I'm saying, it, it is key to talk to Let Russia. Let me ask Mr. Can I suggest Sokolsky? one second, Peter? Sure. I'm, I'm going to get yeah, back to you on ahead. this. Um, Mr. Burns, I understand that you have to leave at 1130. Is that correct? I'm sorry? Okay. I, I just wanted to give any member that might have a question for Mr. Burns before he departed an opportunity to do that. Uh, Peter, do you have any specific well, questions? Well, I'd be interested in your view on uh, what Mr. Abada, or Dr. Abadov said about NATO expansion. And you're, France obviously is a major uh, a, a player there, and what the implication is, the adverse consequences of expansion. 
Yeah, there, there are two questions there. One is the relationship with we want to have with Russia, and I think we over all have an interest in having a, a very cooperative relationship with Russia and working with Russia all across the board on all the issues. I mean, it's right. clearly a partner. The other thing is about NATO expansion in itself. I mean, it has its own logic. Is NATO uh, uh, bound to expand forever, you know, to include more and more countries? Are there limits? to NATO, and this is the question we must ca ask ourselves, this is a strategic question. Uh, so before con considering you know, the next round of expansion, if any, we have to look at this, you know, what are the conse strategic consequences from this? Do we want to extend the Article 5 commitment to you know, uh, many other countries? This is uh, something we, we must deal with and before considering you know, the next round of announcement. So we have to think about the two those two aspects, uh, our relationship with Russia but we and... But we are <laughs> we, uh, well, with all due respect, we are thinking about it. I mean, that's the whole point of what Dr. Abado said. I mean, he's thought about it and he's coming to a conclusion. And obviously, other countries that are part of NATO have to think about it and come to a conclusion. Yeah, uh, and to not uh, come to a conclusion means that it proceeds and then there are consequences of that procession. So it sounds like you're just not prepared to answer it. No, you know, as you know, we have not yet, I mean, NATO has not yet decided to further expand. I mean, this is an issue for the next NATO summit. Uh -huh. So uh, we must have this discussion now within NATO about this. About the missile defense issue, I uh, would just like to mention that, uh, well, missile defense I is being implemented in the U.S., you know, a quite robust program. There is this question of, you know, putting a third um, site in Europe. I think... Uh, what we must do and, and a, a way to, to address Russia's concern will be also to work against the threat itself. I mean, what is very important to have, uh, have the same assessment of the threat and work against the threat. And if there is a threat, uh, you know, of, uh, coming from the Iranian uh, ballistic missiles, we have to work against the threat. And I think this is something on which, uh, you know, Russia, uh, the US, European countries must, must work together. Okay. Just Absolutely. very Did briefly on it. No, you may, as yeah. long as nobody else has a question for Mr. Brown, so go, go ahead quickly. And, and that is, there's a common denominator on some of what we're saying, and the issue of NATO expansion is part of it. I mean, the U.S. made certain commitments to Russia in 1992 and thereafter about NATO expansion. Then, you know, we change our mind, um, which, fine, states can do that, but it has consequences, and it's not like you can take away promises, and then <coughs> one of the things about diplomacy would be that you would have a process and a way of addressing that you'd like to change your mind or you did change your mind that has consequences in how you work that out. That also is underlying the, the basic kind of crisis of legitimacy in a non-proliferation regime. We made promises, made promises on eventual disarmament, made promises on nuclear cooperation, and so on. Now, for very good reasons on some of those, you could argue that the weapon states have learned, they're changing their mind, and so on. But the issue is you, you then need to recognize that the other people whose behavior you're trying to affect feel like you changed the, the terms of the deal unilaterally, and you have to address it. And again, generally in the last 10 or more years, so it goes prior to the, the, the Bush administration, we kind of haven't acted that way. We kind of decide whether the executive or the legislative branch, you know, well, we've changed our mind, and this is the way it's going to be. And, and we're starting to pay for that now because people took it for a while, whether it's Russia or other places, they don't want to take it uh, as much anymore. It doesn't mean you don't expand NATO, but it means that you have to go slower and recognize that you have changed the terms and, and deal with it, I think. Thank you, Mr. Chase. Thank you, gentlemen, for being here. I'm sorry I missed the testimony in the beginning, or actually I missed most of the testimony. Um, I'd like uh, each of you, uh, starting with you, uh, Mr. Greens, to tell me, between China, Russia, U.S., Britain, and France, which is the most engaged in nonproliferation and which is the least engaged? And you, it's uh, your opinion. Yeah, it's, it's another report card. <laughs> 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 uh, well, uh, I think, uh, you know, <laughs> it's difficult to an answer your, your question. Maybe none of I, I know uh, I know about us for sure uh, <laughs> about um, members of the G8 uh, the Chinese uh, on their side you know uh, I think have changed on this uh, they are making more efforts on non-proliferation uh, they are not parts yet of all you know the the, the regimes 
it's difficult to know. I, I, I what I see uh, is what I, I said before. Maybe we were not there yet. Is the fact that in the uh, UN Security Council, I mean, the o all five permanent members have supported these uh, five resolutions I've talked about: the two about North Korea, the three about uh, Iran, uh, and have supported measures. Uh, China, uh, I mean. Four of the f uh, three of the five permanent members are member of the six party talks. Uh, the five permanent members are member of the uh, P5 plus one efforts on Iran. So uh, I think uh, the five now are fully committed to to uh, to uh, deal with the Iranian and the North Korean nuclear challenge at this point. So. Uh, I wouldn't grade them at this point because I think it's you very. You gave, me, you gave me a diplomatic answer, and you're a diplomat. Let's <laughs> tell the doctor. I, I will not be diplomatic. Right. <laughs> I think that to me, there is no doubt that Britain is number one in all, in every respect, as the country which contributes most and behaves ex excellently with respect to non proliferation treaty regime okay. and everything else. Britain has its nuclear, uh, peaceful nuclear facilities under IAEA control. Britain has provided the record of all peaceful material produced during the years of Cold War. Uh, Britain is member of uh, CPBT and so on and so forth. Um, the second after Britain uh, probably would be France. The third would be Russia. And the last and worst would be United States. With respect to China, it's not clear. I cannot make assessment of China because Chinese nuclear activities are a fact. We do not know what they are doing with the nuclear forces, weapons, and their strategy is more like a declaratory strategy. We do not know whether it's uh, true that China has non use commitment. I'm going to come back and just ask you uh, the question, what are the, the best indications of why the U.S. seems to be the least engaged? Uh, Dr. Goldsmith? How would you uh, come? <coughs> well, first of all, I, I, I agree with the, the ordering of the first yeah. two best with uh, uh, the UK certainly is the best. And we just heard uh, this week uh, uh, Margaret uh, Beckett uh, pleading for complete disarmament in the long term and having a vision uh, which was very, very forceful. So uh, I would agree with the first two, France being second. Uh, the other three, I, w I would find it difficult to, to rate them because uh, for different reasons, they, are, they, are, they could do better. O all three could do better. Uh, for, the, for the U.S., I think um, um, I think the U.S. is, is not listening enough to the concerns of non-nuclear weapon states uh, in the lack of progress in nuclear disarmament. And the U.S. with all the, the, the idea of testing new weapons, improving new weapons, uh, having uh, bunker-busted uh, nuclear weapons, and all this is giving the absolutely wrong signal. And I would say it is, it is incompatible with the undertaking under the NPT. So, and the Indian deal is, is a nail in the coffin of the non-proliferation regime. So that's for me. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm going to come back to you, Doctor, but let me uh, just first get Sikorsky. A fun question. Uh, let's take that word engagement, which I know you love, out of it because then they're all the same. Everyone's equally engaged. Engagement's kind of like a word that can mean almost everything. But as far as who's doing best to help and hurt, that's an easier thing to answer. I'd say ver very much on the top would be the first term of the Bush administration. Uh, Libya, say what you will, but Iraq, PSI, actually was pretty principled about not helping India during the first term. Pretty good. Uh, then after that, I would rate the UK next for a reason not listed. They came out with a white paper on energy, and they came up with this very novel idea, which is, we're in favor of nuclear power, but we would like private finance. Oh my God, I apologize, sir. That's good Lord, if I could do that. I apologize. Uh, yeah. Good Lord. <laughs> <laughs> like 
Thank you. We don't care. Do so don't worry. All right. About it. Uh, this is dreadful. Uh, it, it, you know, <laughs> frankly, it, on, a, <laughs> on a scale of one to ten, Actually, it's about a one. I, I wish I can't get a hold of him. I don't know how to reach him. I've never talked with the man. Okay. Ex except once. So, so the, <laughs> the first term of the Bush administration is very good. The next would be the UK because of their white paper where they say, do not invest uh, public money in the promotion of nuclear power. It's a very clear principle. France next because of all the good work they've done on <coughs> country neutral uh, propositions, but grossly subsidizing nuclear power and the construction of nuclear plants in Finland. A very bad idea and something the EU is tr you know, not paying attention to and enforcing its own rules against. Uh, third, I would say, is uh, Russia, principally because I think they think nonproliferation is something which is on the bargaining table all the time. Oh, well, if you want something, then we, you have to give us something. I don't think they yet understand that these concerns are not on the table, that, that they're off the table and ought to be off the table for any mature nation, and that we have to work to figure out how to promote nonproliferation, not bargain over it. A and in this regard, they're holding this fuel uh, and the giving of it to Iran hostage for some kind of deal on some other matter having to do with Europe. Uh, this is, well, I'm, I don't, it, it is, they could be more principled about withholding that fuel and say they won't do it as a matter of a UN resolution. They have not chosen to do that. Finally, China is this mystery, and I would assume the worst. Thank you, Mr. Hitchcock. I, um, I strongly agree with, with the UK, and if you, if you take the reasons we all struggle with, the, the list grows, actually, right. of, of things that um, they've done. And I would add that Henry gave credit to, uh, that Libya was a very important benchmark for his, his evaluation of the first Bush term, but the UK uh, in, in many ways drove that, Tony Blair drove that, so to add that to their tally. Um, I, I kind of put the US and France uh, about, uh, I think in a same, similar category, because I think the US has actually led in all the good things that have happened, but we've also led in, in all the bad things. Um, and so, and, and so it's this really mixed kind of, 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 of record. And I think France has worked with the U.S. on all the good things, um, and then, and then proposed some other good things that we don't do, so their good things are better than, you know, than, than some of what we've done. But also, um, in many ways, I think France is going to have a much harder time on the issue of nuclear disarmament than the U.S. will. And so you've already started to see that with France in 2000. Explain that. Why is that? Um, and, I, and obviously, I'm, you know, Martin and others could disagree. Um, France, France is very, very determined and committed to have nuclear weapons as uh, uh, both for its security, but also as a matter of identity and great power. Um, that if you look at the international system, and France was, um, France was, it has a permanent seat on the Security Council and so on. And, and many people who comment look and say, well, if you're going to redesign the international order, you know, the veto there wouldn't make as much sense. It would be a common European seat and so on and so forth. Nuclear weapons are a, and this is true for Russia also, are uh, the, the hallmark of, of great power in, in many ways. And so it goes to um, national identity in, in ways beyond the security requirements. And so you see when the U.S. in the nonproliferation process in 2000 started to say, well, the disarmament commitments that we made, we, it, we actually don't really those are outdated and so on. Well, France, you know, emphatically shared, uh, shared that view. And uh, France isn't so happy about what the United Kingdom is doing now and the statements that are being made in the UK on going further uh, to nuclear disarmament. And in fairness to France, the margin there is, is relatively slight. They only have uh, a couple of hundred of, of nuclear weapons. And so I think, um, but so I think France has been key. I think Russia's uh, kind of below their, for reasons, I mean, it's done some positive things. It's more ambivalent. It's industry. It's nuclear industry has to fight for market share, um, understandably, because we're not going to cut them in. People aren't going to do, you know, say you have this piece, you have that piece. And so that causes issues. And then China, I think, as others say, um, it's been free riding in a lot of ways. But I think it, I mean, going to China and talking to people there, they are taking this more seriously. Um, 
as an issue. Um, the role they've played on North Korea is actually, uh, has, has become uh, more positive. Um, and so I think there's a learning, remember there are kind of late entry entries into this, but I think th there's a long way to go there. I know we need to go to another witness, but I, I'd like you, Mr. Sweeney, to, uh, to respond. I, I want to just inject that it's my understanding that the United States in the last 10 years has dramatically reduced its arsenal uh, to a levels almost going into the 50s. So, yes. Right, but we have about 6,000 uh, nuclear weapons. They're more effective today, but. But, but, it, but no, six, I mean, and j just on that, I mean, the problem with that, are it's all true and it's very, it's been heroic. And then, but a lot of the rest of the world hears it like a plantation owner saying, well, I used to have 10,000 slaves and now I've got 6,000 and so aren't I okay. doing well? Yeah. That's a good, uh, interesting analysis. <laughs> yes, sir. And then we'll uh, uh, relinquish my time. Yeah, thank you. Just a short comment about uh, <laughs> what George just said. I mean, deterrence remains at the core of our defense policy, as President Chirac uh, reminded last year in his speech. At the same time, the nuclear doctrine is based on uh, what is called minimal deterrence and strict sufficiency. But at the same time, we are committed, like all the nuclear weapon states, to nuclear disarmament. Uh, and actually, France is the only nuclear weapon state which has taken ir irreversible steps we are the only ones, for example, to have dismantled our nuclear test site or dismantled our uranium production facilities. So there are speeches and there are realities. And uh, on this, I think uh, the scorecard is uh, A. <laughs> <laughs> but you got some nodding ahead, at least. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shays. And I, I don't know if you heard me before, if you were here in the room, Mr. Brenz is going to be departing in about five minutes. You may want to load up on Mr. Depart Brenz first. Depart die. Can you think of another word besides depart? <laughs> <laughs> it means leave, but he's leaving shortly, and you may yeah. want to load up on him first. Well, thank, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I want to uh, thank all the witnesses for your, your testimony. I'm sorry I missed uh, a lot of your oral testimony, but I've had a chance to uh, read some of the written uh, testimony and uh, thank all of you for some of your very good ideas on strengthening the nonproliferation regime, both on the compliance and verification and the other measures uh, that you've talked about. Uh, the challenge, of course, is even if we put all these recommendations in place uh, today or in the medium term, and I don't, yeah, I think that would be an aggressive schedule in the medium term to get some of these adopted. We still have some very hard cases that are before us uh, today, uh, and I was interested, uh, uh, Dr. Arbatov, in your your ranking of the uh, commitment on on nonproliferation with Britain, France, Russia, and the United States, uh, because whereas I agree with um, what uh, Dr. Perkovich just said, the United States has often case been, been the bad guy on some issues. We've also taken what I believe is a leadership role on some of the hard cases. And it gets a little bit to the point uh, that uh, Mr. Sikorsky raised with respect to Iran. And my question is, since that is one of the obvious very hard cases facing us right now, and that a lot of the recommendations that have been made today, while excellent, uh, may not have an immediate impact on the situation there. The question is, how can the international community constructively bring its pressure to bear on the Iranian program? And if each of you had absolute powers with respect to uh, something you would recommend to the international community on a course of action they should take today to deter Iran from continuing to move forward with its enrichment program and to send a signal to Iran that really uh, they can't continue to ignore the UN security resolutions and something that will would be a combination of carrots and sticks or whatever you want. I mean, maybe all carrots, all sticks, whatever it is. I'm interested in your proposal because there are lots of, there are a number of bills that have been introduced in Congress. As you well know, this is a very heated discussion in the United States. And there is a sense that while the United States has uh, been trying to encourage the international community to take stronger measures, that there has not been uh, the kind of cooperation from the international community on this issue with respect to bringing pressure to bear on Iran, especially through some kind of economic uh, sanctions that would really bite. Uh, so I'm interested in, from each of you, in what specifically you would recommend that the international community do, the Security Council or whatever other forum, to address the Iranian uh, nuclear program. 
maybe we could begin with uh, you since you have to leave uh, first. Uh, Thank Mr. you. Brianz. I mean, of course, this is an extremely important question because this is one we are looking at right now because we are considering now uh, the next step. As you know, Iran has not gone back to suspension of its enrichment activities, so uh, we have no choice but to raise the pressure on Iran at this point. I mean, the approach we've posted so far is a double-track approach. On one hand, uh, keeping the door of the negotiation open should Iran take the right decision. On the other hand, raising pressure on the regime so that it takes the right decision. Uh, and so we are there now. That what we have to do is to raise the pressure. We have to do it first and foremost in the UN because the message of unity that we give there uh, is very important. It's very visible. And, you know, the Iranians don't like to be uh, uh, put uh, on the on the grill. So we, we have to be very, uh, we, we have to adopt a robust resolution in the UN in the upcoming weeks. Uh, and it will show that Russia, China, all the members of the Security Council are on board, and it's not a confrontation between the US or Iran or between the West and Iran, it's all of us. We have to make sure also that measures against Iran are effective and financial measures are proving effective. I mean, private actors are already reacting to the, the prospect of a crisis with Iran. They are not investing anymore. They are reducing their commitments and it's proving effective. So we have to continue working on this. Just, uh, uh, but what is important also, as I said, is the unity among us. And on this, I, I would just like to mention that, you know, kind of unilateral measures taken uh, by the US, for example, uh, against your partners on this, I'm not sure would help. Uh, actually, it could be the contrary. We are resolved to solve this problem because we know what could be the consequences of a nuclear Iran. And we have actually taken the lead on this uh, three years ago. So uh, I think it's very important that we continue working together very uh, closely uh, because that's really the most important message for the Iranian and the Iranian people, you know, that the regime is going to lead them into isolation. Uh, but if we divide us, if we divide among us, it's going to be a victory for the Iranians. So we have to be very careful about this too. So the recommendation is follow Tami adopt a robust resolution in the UNS, uh, in the UN Security Council. Thank you. Thank you. If I could just get your other other views on that, because absolutely uni unity is, uh, excuse me, Mr. <laughs> ben Holler, sure. sorry, sorry. Mr. Brenz, we want to thank you very, very much for your participation here this morning, and we appreciate you taking the time out, and we recognize that you do have to leave, so please feel free to do that, and thank you again. Thank you. And as we get the uh, unity, of course, is important, but then, of course, the sa there also has to be meaningful action. And sometimes there's an uh, inverse relationship between unified action and, and really meaningful action. So I would be uh, interested if you keep that in mind. If okay. May I? Well, I do not know what to advise to the world community because I don't know the telephone number. But uh, if I could, uh, with all due respect, uh, have some advice to American leadership. I have a number of proposals. First, I would like to advise to American leadership to say to Russia, we are willing to proceed with nuclear disarmament negotiations and make a new strategic reduction treaty uh, which would supersede the START-1 which expires in 2009. Go for lower levels take into account your concerns. We accept your proposal on uh, Azerbaijani radar and invite you to cooperate with us on our project to have a joint defense against rogue states. We tell you we will not start pulling Ukraine by its ears into NATO as long as you cooperate with us on what is very important to us, that is Iran. And finally, we will get out of Iraq as quickly as possible because while we stay in Iraq, Iran uh, feels very strong. Once we start withdrawing, Iran will feel very vulnerable. Iran will have a huge problem and will become much more flexible and cooperative. Iran does not believe that America will take any military action against Iran um, till America stays bogged down in Iraq. Uh, I would further say to Europeans, go forward with your incentives. Your incentives are very good. 
uh, WTO membership, investment in oil, and all, uh, all other things that the European three countries have already proposed, expand on that as incentives to Iran to, uh, to be uh, uh, in compliance with uh, what we requi require from it. And finally, I would tell Iran, you have a certain number of uh, enrichment centrifuges. This is negotiable. We do not ask of you, do not have any. You may keep some. That is a subject of negotiation, provided that they are, are under SARA IAM control and that you do not go further with enrichment capability. Uh, and uh, uh, in that case, we would be willing to provide you with all kinds of positive incentives that you may want. As for China, I think that, uh, again, since China is so uh, unpredictable and hard to understand, um, I, I do not have any advice to the United States as to what to say to China, but I don't think China will stay isolated once Russia, United States, and European states take a common position towards Iran. Not an easy question. Um, yeah, I would agree with uh, Martin Brien that uh, what impresses most uh, Iran is the unity in the Security Council. Uh, that, of course, you can do a lot of things unilaterally to put pressure on Iran, but the real, real thing is uh, Iran is not North Korea, and Iran wants to be. Uh, a normal trade partner, they don't want to be isolated. So if they feel, and they are trying to convince the world all the time uh, that they are not isolated. And of course, creating relationship with Venezuela or Sudan and others, or Myanmar or whatever, or North Korea is, is not exactly not being isolated. Uh, so uh, th this, this is very, very powerful. And therefore, I mean, again, I, I agree. Well, Russia is key, and I don't think China would, would stand behind. Um, I <coughs> to come with what Mr. Arbatov said about the centrifuges, because I will stay in, in my field of competence. Uh, I, I think it's it's very problem problematic because uh, to tell them today you can have some centrifuges as long as it is under IE safeguards and, and things like that. This is going against uh, three UN Security Council resolutions. And I don't see how you can do that. So we have a problem. The Iranians say, we are never going to give up. And the Security Council three times has said, you have to suspend. And the whole question is, how can we uh, not compromise on the principles of Security Council resolution while finding a face-saving solution for Iran? Now, I might have some ideas on that, but if I told you what the ideas were, it would be um, they wouldn't be worth anymore, so I can't, I can't give, unfortunately, these ideas here. But we have to be flexible, uh, subtle, uh, and still try to find ways that save face and do not, does not compromise on the principles. That's all I can say. Uh, first, let me uh, say that I think George is right, and I, I think the sense that was expressed uh, by your committee that the U.S. has been in at the very lead of doing good things, but also very bad things. You'll notice that I said something about how good the first term was. I, I didn't mention anything beyond that. Uh, I'll leave it to you to fill in the blank. Um, I'd say there's five things. First. If you can get the UN Security Council to come up with default actions that are country neutral with regard to testing by countries that are in violation of the NPT or their IA obligations, uh, and if you could get default actions with regard to withdrawals from the NPT with regard to violators, that would be good. Next, I think we should continue to enforce as many conventions that the U.S. agrees to with regard to the law of the sea 
in the Persian Gulf. We are doing this now under Task Force uh, 50 and 151. Uh, there are a good number of countries there with us. We want the number of countries enforcing freedom of the sea in that area to go up. The Iranians surely can count, uh, and they, they want us out of that region. If they see more coming in, they might deduce there's a reason. <coughs> we should stop and or think clearly about rewarding countries that have military to military relations with Iran. Right now, the only country I can think of that does that we're thinking of giving very sensitive nuclear and space technology to is India. I would not do that. I would condition approval of uh, controlled nuclear and, and rocket related controlled goods to India on it for swearing its formal military to military relations with Iran. They claim they're very minor, so it shouldn't be a big deal for them to give it up. But if Congress goes ahead, people will notice there as well that there's really no penalty for being very close with Iran. Finally, I would keep the two other things. I would keep uh, the sanctions that you do have in place for oil and gas investments. I think they've been very effective in discouraging the kinds of investments and tech transfers that would make it possible for Iran to make more money uh, out of its oil and gas fields. In fact, the amount of oil and gas that's being pumped out of the ground has gone down and will continue as long as those investments aren't made. So I would keep up a strong front as much as possible on that. And last but not least, I think the U.S. and all other countries should uh, think twice about promoting nuclear power domestically and internationally unless they are investments that private capital can back. Those investments that private capital can't back, uh, we should think twice about. This is a very big topic because presumably you can't pick on nuclear power. You have to do that with solar, wind, and everything else. We need somehow to move in that direction. A big, big, big problem, but one that needs to be tackled. I mean, I think we, we all agree, but it, it bears saying that, that the greatest leverage and, and, and a very top imperative is to keep the Security Council together and move forward. And my colleague Kareem Sajapur, who's very, very good on Iran, talks about it's, you know, we tend to want to push for kind of deep and most biting sanctions and then, and then you get a narrow coalition. And in the case of Iran, it's the breadth of the coalition that carries more power than actually the, the depth of the sanctions. And I think that's um, important. And also that we should stipulate, no, none of us knows whether this stuff will work. I mean, this is a really tough case and maybe it, it won't. I mean, so there's no guarantees. At most right now, what we can aim to do is generate a political debate within Iran to, to, to reinitiate what had been a debate before and then see what, where those politics um, lead. I think um, that I think it's important for the Congress, you know, to, to threaten in a sense more sanctions, but, but that's a deterrent, uh, not to implement them for reasons I don't know, you weren't here, but at the beginning, uh, my test might talk about some real problems in the drafts that are there that, are, that just don't make sense or they're counterproductive, but just as a general approach, I think it enables the U.S. government and the British government and others to be able to, to lean on the Germans and others to, to be a little tougher if there's a threat that Congress is going to do something stupid, basically. Um, but if Congress does something stupid, then it doesn't, I'm just being colloquial, but that's kind of how it goes, um, you know, then, then that, that, that leverage is potentially lost. Um, and, and to that end, I, as I talked about, I think private disinvestment and, and ways to use moral suasion and grassroots organizing and so on to get stockholders, you know, to, to uh, change their behavior, um, I think is, is has some potency and, and concerns uh, Iran. I, I, on Alexei's point, which I think is a very important point because there, there are lots of people, including perhaps the Director General of the IAEA, who I think, you know, anyway, uh, who, who are talking about kind of embracing or accepting Iran's operation of a certain number of centrifuges and so on because this is unavoidable and so on. Uh, my view is um, that, that that move or acceptance certainly shouldn't be made 
until after Iran has come in compliance and resolved the IAEA questions. And Alexei and I haven't had a chance to talk in the last few days on, 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 on that issue. In other words, it may come as, as, as an end point of negotiations with Iran. We, we may actually have to accept that there would be some level of enrichment, but that should be, it seems to me, unacceptable if they still haven't answered the IAEA's outstanding questions and haven't come back into compliance. Um, and so it's more of a sequencing thing than a, than a categorical thing. But I think to kind of give that away and then they're still not answering the questions, they're still not providing the transparency and everything, then, you know, where, where are you? Um, and the last thing, and I think the administration is doing this, and I think in general that the administration, uh, Henry and I disagree, you know, I think, you know, clearly on this, but I mean, I think the last couple of years the administration on Iran, um, you know, has, has tried to, to have a, a wiser strategy, but part of this would be what I think we're doing is quiet kind of preparation of deterrence and containment capacities around uh, Iran, um, not in a clumsy way, but rallying the neighbors. And then lastly, I've argued for years, um, the surest way to alarm the Iranians is to start pulling out of Iraq. For the U.S., to that, that's their worst nightmare. I've had Iranians acknowledge it to me years ago. Their worst nightmare was we leave Iraq. Um, and so I think there's potency in that argument, too. Certainly, go ahead. Um, when we say, when the United Nations Security Council resolution says suspend the work uh, on enrichment, Iranians perceive it as a denial of their right eventually to have it. Um, however, the, the resolution doesn't say that they have to dismantle on the all the centrifuges that they have. So if they were told directly in particular by the United States, that this is negotiable. We do not deny you the right eventually to have some enrichment, uh, but it should be under full IA control and it should be commensurate with your peaceful energy program. Presently, Iran does not have any reactor that would be supplied by their enrichment capability because Bush Air Reactor will be using Russian fuel and only Russia and Westinghouse are cert certified to produce fuel for that reactor. The, the reactor they are building in Iraq will use natural uranium, and it's dangerous because it may produce plutonium, but it doesn't need enrichment. So if we tell Ira Iran, you will be eventually entitled for some kind of enrichment, and as long as you expand your n peaceful nuclear energy, which may, may take 20 or 30 years, you may have more enrichment. But now, for the time being, you have to, su to suspend it for some time, limited time, uh, and give uh, IAA access to everything, to all materials and sites that they need to remove outstanding issues. I think that is the right approach because all the three resolutions now does, does not, do not affect Iranian action. And we are not going to go to war because of uh, few thousand Iranian centrifuge once we permitted North Korea to withdraw from the NPT Treaty and test a nuclear weapon and still negotiating with it and proposing it new and new concession. That doesn't work. So my proposal is instead of saying all or nothing or we will do nothing to you. That's basically what UN resolution says. We will say we are willing to provide you with a lot of things even within enrichment capability, but if you don't agree to that, then we will do you something very bad. And that could be the common basis of uh, great powers in the United Nations Security Council. Thank you, Mr. Van Hollen. Mr. Shays, you have an additional question. I have one question, and I'm not looking for a long answer, but uh, I get a lot of constituents who write me, and I'd like you to help me respond to them. They say, how dare us tell any other country it, can ha it cannot have nuclear weapons when we have it? Uh, and, I mean, I have my answers. Uh, I, n I don't think they're awesome. <laughs> I don't think they're all that great either. Um, Dr. Arbidoff, I, I didn't let you respond to the – I didn't come back to you to respond to why the United States wasn't so great, but I think the others kind of filled in on that. But tell me, what is your response to countries that don't have nuclear weapons? What right do we s have to say they shouldn't have them? What moral ground do we stand on? I'd like each of you to answer it. 
to put it in a, in a very concise way, I would say that during the years of Cold War, when most of nuclear weapons were with two superpowers, which we barely avoided in nuclear war, and with further expansion of uh, nuclear club, more and more countries become uh, nuclear weapon states. The danger of nuclear wo uh, war becomes virtually unavoidable, and okay. the danger of access of terrorists to nuclear weapon through new nuclear weapon states, which may not have reliable control and safety procedures and so on, is also virtually unavoidable. Uh, so uh, the response to their quite logical and good question is, we want to stop proliferation and to move towards nuclear disarmament among those countries which legitimately now are recognized as nuclear weapon states in the non-proliferation treaty. So there is no inequality and there is no injustice. It's, it's, a, it's a process. Thank you very much. Others, uh, could you expand on that? Or are you satisfied with that answer? I, I, I think that's fundamentally right. I mean, one thing some of us have, have mentioned, I mean, the Foreign Secretary Beckett of the UK gave a speech at our conference, the Carnegie Endowment Conference on Monday that a lot of people have, have talked about. And, and I think the way the UK has formulated this similar position where they have nuclear weapons and, and, and they get asked to some is, is it's along the lines that Alexei pointed to, but I, I think it's worth looking at um, as an answer. And the basic version of it is, is, is yes, it's a temporary, it's meant to be a temporary disparity. And we've kind of gotten off track the last few years in, in resolving that disparity, but it's meant to be temporary and we're committed and prepared, I would argue, to move as fast and as far towards zero as everyone else is prepared to move with us. I guess the question is timing. When you have these weapons, it's not so easy to give them up unless someone's going to take care of your security for you. It's the reason why we hold on to them. And yeah, we want to come down. But if it looks as though the world's going to have more near nuclear weapon states, it's going to be tougher to give them up. So everyone understood this in the late 50s when they went into promoting the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, best not to have additions. If you want us to come down and continue to come down, it's nothing others getting this stuff is going to make more likely. So I, I think the sense there, there, there actually might be unanimity of view on that one point amongst this panel, which might be useful to, to dwell on. Uh, just one, one comment. Uh, this discussion about a little bit of enrichment, you should know that there are people, and I guess I include myself among them, that think that's really uh, a very, very sophisticated and risky proposition because of the inability, really, to be able to know what's going on once you start making nuclear fuel. I guess what particularly worries me besides overestimating the ability of these international organizations to keep track of making fuel is to keep propounding this per se right that everyone keeps propounding, that everyone has the right to get right up the edge to making bombs, no matter how uneconomical or impractical your activity is. No reading, no reading of the treaty that reflects upon what was said in its negotiation and what was done legally can support that view, in my opinion. And I think it's a mistake to start arguing that all that history and law doesn't amount to anything. Thank you. I'll, I'll take one last question, uh, Fagan, on this, and that is, uh, is the prospect of a um, nuclear-free zone in the Middle East, uh, does it have any currency, or is it totally out of the question, if anybody wants to engage in that? I think it's a little like the question that that uh, Congressman Chase just raised, Chase just raised, that um, you we have to we have to hold it out there as an objective that has been agreed by Israel by the U.S. There's a commitment that was made in 1995 as part of the deal to extend, which w the U.S. wanted to extend indefinitely the non-proliferation treaty. So you can't you can't the answer to your question can't be no. Um, it, it has to be that that's an objective that we have to work forward to. And then I think the issue is especially for the U.S., not to be so defensive and afraid to even have the conversation about it, but rather to do the opposite and say, well, let's look at the conditions that would have to be created to make this remotely feasible. 
and the absolute first condition would be that all the states in the region would have to recognize each other's existence because you can't begin to have a discussion you can't have a negotiation you can't verify you can't do any of this if you don't recognize the other guy's existence and you won't even sit at a table with them well that'll stop the issue for about twenty years because you know iran doesn't recognize israel saudi arabia doesn't recognize and so why are we defensive about that i mean it seems to me the position should be okay let's start thinking about those conditions you know let anybody want to come to the meeting and and see who doesn't uh... show up and and then you start talking about okay how would we verify this and oh by the way it's a wmd free zone so it means chemical and biological weapons program too so we have to start coming around and looking to see that none of those exist and 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 so what we've been doing for all these years by saying in essence we don't want to talk about this too sensitive you give them all a free ride to keep pounding and demanding but if you turn it around and say yeah let's talk about your proposal uh, things get real quiet. So. Yeah, I always thought it might be a good reason to start people talking about some of the other issues if you got them around that issue on that. Just let me thank uh, every one of you for your time here this morning. We've only touched upon this subject, obviously, uh, very peripherally. I can only imagine what it's like for the, all of you gentlemen to sit down and have a conversation amongst yourselves. It must go on for, <laughs> for weeks on that and get uh, just more complicated as it goes on. You've been very helpful to us, both your written materials and your comments here today. Uh, will be taken by members of the committee and others, I'm sure, uh, as we grapple with this issue. And we'll take the license to say uh, whether or not you respond, we may certainly get in touch with you in the future for some more ideas and, and more assistance on that. Thank you very, very much.